Hello, welcome to our Lutheran um, sermon series this morning. Uh, thank you for tuning in and joining us this morning or this afternoon or this evening, wherever you're at. If you have your Bibles, you can open it up to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, this is what our devotion will be on today. Thank you again for, for, for being here and let's, let's prepare ourselves and receive God's word. We are here to listen to the word of our creator, our savior, and the one in whom we trust. We are here to worship the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's begin with prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are in part two of this Songs from the Heart Sermon series. And this we are looking at four um, very well-known hymns and um, taking a look at what inspired these these people to write these hymns and last week when we started this series off we heard about um we heard about the the song um, how great thou art and why that inspired the per, the person to write that song um and and you know that that's uh, when you when you think and try to do, describe god you know it could be very difficult how great is God? Now we have a God who is awesome, who is powerful, who is mighty, who is merciful, who is love, and you know, trying to describe those all those put into a, a hymn, it could be very difficult. But this author um, accepted that challenge, and and he wrote down for us just how great our God is, and the Bible tells us how great our God is. Because when sin came into the world, we know that our God made a plan. And that plan included coming here to this earth to live and in, in, in to heal and to love um, human beings, right? And he became flesh. He put on flesh. God, the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, came here and made his living among us. And he... Um, saved us by keeping all of God's laws perfectly. That that was part of the price, was to be a perfect person, to be in front of God, to be considered holy, to stand before a holy God. And the only way that we could become holy is, is for someone doing it for us because we know that we are filled with sin. And Jesus then came here and he kept those laws for us, but then he also took something from us. He took our sins from us and he went to the cross and paid for them. And God, the Father, accepted that that, that price. And, and that's how Jesus redeemed us, bought us back, was by giving himself as our, our substitute. And, and we have this hymn then that, that talks about that. You know, this is how awesome and great our God is to come here to save us. But then he also loves us and continues to love us. And um part of the story that you heard last week was Jesus performing um some pretty amazing miracles and people were looking at that and, and just standing in awe and, and Jesus says you guys are, are are being in awe of these miracles and you're gonna see something more amazing than that. You're gonna see the Son of God um get nailed to the cross dying on the cross and coming back to life three days later. And that's how great our God is, you know, and, and it's just a, a really amazing thing to, to stand back and to marvel at, at what our God has done for us. But another amazing thing is that our God allows us then to become great. And do you remember how we become great? We can't become great by trying to do miracles, right? That's not a, a way of becoming great. Of, of holding a political office, of finding some cure for a disease. No, none of that makes us great. What makes us great is what Jesus did, being humble, 
humbling himself, putting himself lower than people and loving them and serving them. He says, you want to be great? You become the least. Become the least. Man, and friends, that's going to take humility on our end because we then have to lower ourselves, put ourselves lower than people that, that we um, probably can't stand, people that we work with, people that we uh, live with, put ourselves lower than them and love them and serve them. And Jesus says, you want to be great? Do that then. Make yourself least and um, love them because that's what he did, right, for us. And today we're going to take a look at another hymn, um, a hymn that is just a, another really uh, amazing hymn, which is Precious Lord, Take My Hand. When you are, when you sing this hymn, you are reminded then of the kind of God that we have, of, of what he's done for us, of what he continues to do for us. He comes here and, and holds your hand. He takes your hand and holds it, and, and he'll never leave you. He, he grabs you by your hand and, and he leads you. And, you know, the amazing thing is that you might be in the valley of the shadow of death. You might be in a very low point in your life. You might be in the middle of something. You might be in a very good season in your life. But either, either way, this hymn applies to all people because we have a God who will never leave us, a God who is beside us, a God who loves us uh, and, and is there holding our hand. And so let's take a look at um God's word today as we are reminded again of this this powerful hymn from so Mark chapter 5 let's read verses 24 to 26 Jesus went with him and a large crowd was following him pressing tightly uh, against him a certain woman who was there had a discharge of blood for 12 years she had suffered much under the care of many physicians and had spent all that she had Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. We see um, this 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 uh, account in the book of Mark, and Mark tells us um, that Jesus went with him. And who is the him? Who is that that him describing? It's a man named Jairus. See, Jairus um, was a, a a church worker. He worked in a temple. And people respected him. People looked up to him. The community had a good name. And Jesus, we see, you know, go back a few verses here. He is, was down in the southern part, the southeastern part of the Sea of Galilee. And there he performed a really amazing miracle. He, uh, there was this man who was possessed by a demon. And Jesus is having this conversation with this demon. And Jesus commanded the demon to come out of that man, but the demons didn't want to go back to hell. They didn't want to go back there, so they get, asked permission for Jesus then to send them to these this herd of pigs who were on the um, in, on the the hillside, and Jesus gave them that permission, and so they went into the, they left this man went into this these pigs two thousand pigs and the pigs then ran down into the Sea of Galilee and drowned. And, and everyone was very happy, right, that this man was cured from, from this demon possession. They wanted Jesus to stick around and uh, perform many more miracles, right? No, unfortunately, they didn't. The people didn't want Jesus. They became so afraid that they asked Jesus to leave. He said, get away from us. We don't want you here. And And... So Jesus then got in a boat, and, and we see that he goes back to the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, and there we see meet this man named Jairus. And he, Jairus has a 12-year-old daughter who he describes to Jesus as um, who is sick, who is dying. And so Jairus meets Jesus and says, come see my daughter who is dying. And so Jesus is going with him, and, and we see this picture then, right? There's... Not only is there just Jairus there, but there's tons of people there, lots and lots of people, and they are surrounding Jesus, pressing tightly against him, as as uh, Mark tells us, pressing tightly against him. And there we get introduced to uh, another person in the crowd, a woman, and this just wasn't any ordinary regular woman. This woman had some some 
difficulties in her life, physically and spiritually. Physically, what was she enduring? It says she had a, a bleeding problem, a discharge of blood for 12 years. So she had a bleeding problem. And in 12 years, you know, you think about the amount of people who have to endure some type of illness. And 12 years, you know, is a very difficult, long years to have a medical issue. And this lady was was having this discharge for 12 years and she was going to visit doctor after doctor after doctor trying to get better. And instead of getting better, it says she got worse. She she grew worse from this illness. And she also spent everything she had. So not only was she, you know, a a you know sick woman you know, having discharge, but she was broke. She was um you know, near the end of, of maybe just giving up. Um, she she was getting worse. And another thing that, that's interesting is this lady was considered, according to the Jewish laws, she was considered unclean. And which means she had to stay away from people, right? She couldn't go out in public. So so imagine you know, what's going through with this woman. You know, she, she had to stay away from people. She was considered unclean. She couldn't go to the temple to worship. So she had to remain isolated. And we know what that feels like because you know, we're, we're coming out of isolation, right? This COVID issue from a number of years where we were told to stay away from everyone, right? Just keep to yourself, keep to your families, stay away from people, stay away from public. And, and so we kind of understand this, this lady, you know, just having to, to remain isolated away from people instead of interacting socially with them. It could be very, very difficult. And, and that's what happened to this. And um, she was suffering. And, and friends, that, that kind of gives us to, you know, brings us to a question, you know, with uh, with us, you know, how, how often, you know, this, this lady, the way that she tried to handle this issue was she gave everything she had. She paid everything, right? So she used a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of her money to try to get better in it. Instead of getting better, she got worse. And, and that sounds pretty familiar to the stories that, that you and I have, right? We think that by using our money to go after things in this world, to 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 take the pain away, to enjoy, to to enjoy things, right? Um in, in our lives just because we feel like we deserve it, right? Or we have issues in our life where then we turn to these um resources these things to try to take that pain away from us right could be you know easily drugs and alcohol right how often have we spent money spent tons of money on drugs and alcohol just trying to numb ourselves because of the things that are going on in our life or how, how often have we spent tons of money trying to make money right at a casino right we think that this last 20 dollars that we have from our paycheck, which was just deposited into our accounts that morning, and we only have twenty dollars left, and we think that we could make more if we just go to the casino and 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 win it back, right? How often have we fell for that that lie? Um, what about sports, right? We think that our our kid is the next LeBron James, and so we have to enter them in all these camps and all these tournaments and spend hundreds of dollars traveling, eating out gas money, motels, so that this kid could play basketball because we think that he's going to get to the NBA or to to the rodeos, right? And and so so how often have we done what this lady has did was to pay and, and thinking that that's going to, to help us, right? Well, you know, what if Jesus came to your, came to you today and he looked at your checking account, would you be embarrassed? If he looked and examined where your money was going, would you want him to look at that? And, you know, Jesus, we know, the Bible tells us that he died for all of our sins. He forgave us from all of our sins. God has forgiven you. And so when Jesus, we, uh, you know, are, are a perfect and holy child that belongs to Jesus, 
why then do we want to run back to those sins that Jesus paid for? Why do we want to say, you know what, Jesus, I, I know what you did, but I don't care because the sin makes me feel good and I'm going to keep doing it. How much energy and money and resources um, do we need to, to, to spend and lose before we realize this is meaningless, right? And we, we do those things because of the sinful nature we live with. But it's not an excuse to keep doing it because Jesus says, crucify it. Put to death that sinful nature and, and live the way that you I, I've given you freedom to live, which is free from sins, not going back to them. And, and so, we, so we think that we can turn to things in this world to make our lives better, but it doesn't get any better. It gets worse. And that's what this lady did. She, instead of getting better from what the doctors were trying to do for her, she, she got worse. And so she needed someone to take her hand and lead her. And who was that? Let's continue in verses 27 and 29. When she heard what was being said about Jesus, she went up behind him in a crowd and touched his robe. She said, if I just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately her, immediately her flow of blood stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed from her affliction. Jesus comes into town, and he's the only person that can lead her, that can heal her. And she goes to him. And it says she heard about what was being said about Jesus, and there was probably tons of things being said about Jesus. She, Jesus was there were probably stories about Jesus healing Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Right, she was sick in bed, and Jesus went to her, and next thing you know, that fever left her, and she was feeling a lot better. Jesus healed her, or maybe they, she this lady heard about the leprosy, the the, the leper um, man who had leprosy, and and how Jesus healed him. Maybe she heard about how these men, you know, Jesus was sitting inside of a house and there was so many people in the house, so many people outside the house that these men who brought their, their, their friend who was um, a, a paralyzed man who couldn't move and they had him on a stretcher and, and they, could, they couldn't get this man to, to Jesus. So was, she probably heard about how these men tore open the roof and, and lowered their friend right down in front of Jesus and how Jesus healed him because that man got up and carried his mat, right? And, and, and he was healed. He could all of a sudden move his body. So this lady probably heard about all of these things. And so she, she heard about Jesus. And so she went to Jesus and she makes her way up to him. And, and in faith, what does she say? If I just touch his robe, I will be healed. Maybe a question that, that we can ask at this time is, is why didn't she want Jesus to know? Why didn't she just stop Jesus and, and the whole um, parade that was happening? Why, why didn't she get in front of it and, and put a halt to it and say, Jesus, I need you, instead of coming up behind him and, and reaching out and, and touching him? She was probably embarrassed, right? She had a medical issue, an embarrassing, maybe an embarrassing medical issue that she didn't want anybody to know. And you, you, you think about some medical issues that, that you've experienced that, that you probably don't want people to know about. And, and so that's what made her reach out then and touch Jesus. And when she did that, what happened to her? She was healed. It says her bleeding stopped. She felt in herself getting better. She was healed from her affliction just from reaching out and in the faith touching Jesus. So then what happened? Let's continue. Verse 30, 32. At that moment, Jesus knew that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing tightly against you, and yet you say, who touched me? Nevertheless, he kept looking around to see who had done this. So there's another person there that, that the Bible tells us here. Mark tells us there's someone else there who knew that this lady was healed. She felt in herself that she was healed, but there was someone else who knew 
that that she was healed and and that was Jesus because he says that power Jesus felt that power leave him so he starts looking around and, and asking who touched my robe he keeps looking looking and then his disciples are maybe kind of thinking okay Jesus is uh acting a little weird here because there's a lot of people Jesus it could have been any one of these guys look at all the people that are pressing against us any one of them could have gotten healed and and you're asking who touched who touched me and but but Jesus Jesus knew who touched him okay but he, he's asking this question for for three reasons okay three reasons of, of why he asked this who who touched me? First was Jairus, right? Because remember, Jairus is, is the reason why Jesus is there at that moment. Because Jairus is waiting for him at the shore, and he's telling he told Jesus, My daughter is dying. I want you to come come to, to my house to heal her. And so Jesus Jairus is there trying to get Jesus help. And so Jesus is doing this for Jairus because he wants Jairus to, to, to know what happened. And, and that he came to the right place. He came to the right person, to the only person who could heal his daughter. And so he did this to reassure Jairus, there's this woman that I'm healing, and I want you to know about it. The second reason why Jesus did this is for his disciples. He was preparing his disciples to carry on the ministry. He, he lived with them, and he taught them, and he performed miracle after miracle, and, and they witnessed those miracles and because Jesus was preparing them now, and he's saying, look what you're going to encounter. And you're going to have days like this as well. And so he was doing this to, to reassure the disciples that I'm with you. Because look at, look at the things that I'm doing, and you're going to do them. And finally, the third reason why he did this was for the woman. Because the woman knew what happened, and now she knows Jesus knows. And so what does she do? Let's continue. Let's finish up with verses 33, 34. The woman was trembling with fear since she knew what had happened to her. She came forward, fell down in front of him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your suffering. And so in this woman now, she probably was, after she touched Jesus, she maybe stood back. And sees that Jesus is looking around because he knows. And she knows now. And so she comes forward. And as Mark says, she's trembling with, with fear. She was afraid. Maybe because she was unclean and she wasn't supposed to be in that place. Maybe she was afraid that Jesus was going to undo the miracle and, and make her sick again. But whatever reason, she came full of fear, trembling with fear. And so she falls on her knees and she tells Jesus everything. She tells Jesus how she was sick, how she was broke, her problem, her bleeding problem. Probably told him about doctor after doctor and how she just got worse. She told him everything. And Jesus, how does she respond? Look what he calls her, daughter. It's the only time in the Gospels where Jesus used that term with the term with a woman, he calls her daughter. And in a Jewish culture, that, that is a very loving word, daughter. We hear that, you know, in, in the Old Testament scriptures, how, how God calls his people that daughter of Zion. That's a very loving term. And now Jesus calls this woman, daughter. You look for me. You came to the right place. You found me. You had trust in me. You knew that I could heal you. And you've heard the stories and you believe. And now go in peace. Shalom is the word that he used. Have peace. You are healed. This woman was sick, tired, worn, beaten. But now she's lifted back up. Jesus grabs her hand and leads her and, and gives her peace and, and heals her. And the word that, that Mark uses here to describe healed is actually a word that means saved. And so Jesus, we see, not only healed her physically, but he saved her. 
spiritually. He said, you're, you're the right place. This is what I, I can give you. And you have peace now. Your sins are paid for. Not only are you, you healed physically, but spiritually you're healed. You're saved. And, and friends, that's, that's the Savior that we have who's, who's done that for you. He's, he's healed you of, of all, the, you know, especially the, the sickness of, of sin. Jesus came and he took that from you. He paid that price for you, healing you. And now you are clean, made clean in the blood of Jesus. You are holy and perfect when, when, when you believe in Jesus. When, when you trust in Jesus. This hymn, Precious Lord, was written by a man named Thomas Dorsey. Thomas Dorsey um, was a man who was born in 1899, and he was a musician, and, and he uh, relocated to a place, um, to Chicago, to uh, play music, but then there he switched his genre he was now a, a christian a musician and a very good one and he uh, had a wife and a, and a son um uh, family but when he had um you know he was in, in a demand for revivals and he was invited to a revival in um in uh, st louis missouri but he wasn't really sure if he should go because his wife at the time was pregnant. And um, but she reassured him, you know, just, just go ahead and go. And and so he did. And while he was in St. Louis uh, performing at this revival, singing at this revival, he got word that his wife had died during labor. You know, she gave birth to the son, and she had died. And so he he left. Uh, St. Louis back to Chicago, but on you know, when he got to the hospital, he found out that his son also died. The baby died. And he had to, to bury his wife and, and child and put them in the same casket. Yeah, as, as he was grieving, he visited a, a friend um, at, a, at a local college. And there at the local college, he started to write a song. And that's what we have today, Precious Lord. And he wrote those words. And in his time of grieving, of sorrow, of pain, he turned to God. He turned and wrote this beautiful song because of the faith that he had in his Savior. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me. You're with me. Help me stand. And, and friends, we you might might have a similar story. Like Thomas Dorsey, we've lost friends, we've lost family, we've lost children, we've lost husbands and wives and siblings. So maybe we we have a a, a, a familiar story. Or we can connect with this story from Thomas Dorsey. But if we haven't been stung by death, then maybe we've been challenged in our faith. Maybe we lost jobs because we are a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Maybe we've been demoted because we rather trust in Jesus. Maybe we've lost our health, the ability to take care of ourselves, the ability to see, the ability to hear, the ability to use our body, our, our body um, to, you know, do the basic things in life. Maybe we, we've lost some of those things, but we can take a look at this hymn and sing it because we know a Savior who is there with us a Savior who loves us, a Savior who we can trust in. That's what this woman found when she turned to Jesus and heard about Jesus and believed in Jesus and trusted in Jesus. She had a Savior who was there, who was there to hold her hand. Thomas Dorsey believed that. And, and you and I, you know, your sin might be burdening you. You might be in a valley or the shadow of death. You might be um, burdened with sins, maybe a, a, a sin that people know about and still bring up. You know, how, however ugly and heavy that sin is, we have a Savior who, who took those sins from you and he put them on himself and he died because he loves you. 
He said, this is how much I love you. I'm willing to put my life on a tree and be crucified and, and to die for you. And he took those sins that he paid for them and he came back to life and now he's ruling. And, and that's who we turn to, friends. You have a savior who, who you can turn and, and trust him when you're alone, when you're confused, when you're angry, when you're depressed. A savior who can take your hand and hold you. But you also have a savior who can hold your hand during those good days, will never let go. Who you can sing to. Maybe you're singing a song at this time, and, and, and guess what, friends? Guess who hears you when you sing the song? God hears you. He hears you. And, and he's always there with you. And that's why we find comfort in, in this account, this woman who had nothing, and she found a Savior who gave her everything. We have a Savior who's given you everything. Peace, joy, eternal life, love, who will never leave you, who will always hold your hand. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.